Shenango Coke plant on Neville Island will now close after the first of the year. Any moment, the old smokestacks at the Shenango Coke plant works will be imploded. They've been uh, working for about two years to clean up this site. Uh, DTE Energy out of Detroit actually owns the site. And these are the old sacks where you heard the first blast. I'll just let you watch. Welcome to We Can Be. I'm Chris DeCarty, and one of the great perks of being host of our podcast is being able to meet some of the most respected and trusted experts in their fields. This includes today's guest, Dr. George Thurston, who is a pioneer in the study of human health effects and air pollution. Dr. Thurston's environmental studies career began at Brown University, where he developed his own independent majors. And more than 40 years later, he continues to connect and inspire scientists, physicians, and policymakers to save the planet and to save lives. He is a professor in the Departments of Environmental Medicine and Population Health at the New York University School of Medicine. And he led a groundbreaking Heinz Endowments funded study focusing on the many health benefits Pittsburgh region communities experienced after the closing of the Shenango Coke Works on Neville Island. That study garnered international attention. He's an expert at communicating the scientific complexities of environmental challenges in ways that are easily understood by all. And his expertise has been featured in the New York Times, The Guardian, U.S. News World Report, and on NBC, CNN, NPR, to name just a few. Dr. Thurston, it is a pleasure to have you with us today. Welcome to We Can Be. Glad to be here. So today is a perfect day to have this conversation. I was driving to work. We're based in downtown Pittsburgh. It's a cloudy, uh, low ceiling day, and I couldn't see the top of our tallest building. So I'm relatively new to Pittsburgh, and when I'm here, one of the first things I here is you should have been here 50 years ago. On a day like today, you wouldn't have been able to see not only across the river, but down the block. Given that you have spent your career looking at air pollution and its impacts on human health, what is getting better? What have we been doing right as a country on air pollution and and human health? So many things. We have work left to do, but the improvement over those last 50 years has been spectacular because the Clean Air Act, and it's been a a real success in implementing the laws and the regulations and getting a nationwide collective action because pollution respects no borders and it travels long distances, uh, especially particulate matter, which is what I've studied, particles in the air. And before 1970, before the Clean Air Act, it was up to each state to sort of regulate their own. That did not work very well at all because local political influences really would override every time. And the progress just wasn't wasn't being made. But then once the federal government, there was an EPA overlooking everything and saying, okay, you're going to have to, you're violating the standards and you've got to take, you've got to come up with a plan. The great thing about the Clean Air Act is it lets each state come up with their own plan. They all have the same goal, but they don't have to reach it the same way. But ultimately, the EPA does have the hammer that it's never used, which is that it could technically take away federal dollars from the states. So that's a big hammer that the EPA has been given. States would be paying in taxes, but then not getting anything back. That would not be a desirable situation for any state. Super interesting. So uh, we used to have a situation where if I wanted to address what I might get, which is local residents very concerned about pollution that was impacting them, I could on one level just build a super tall smokestack and send that down the road to somebody that actually didn't elect me in this mix. And that's a little bit of the Wild West that I think you described historically. Yes. But what we did is we said about, what is this, 1992? So we're looking at several decades ago now. We said, no, we actually, as a nation, have an overriding interest to reduce pollution. Today we add a long-awaited and long-needed chapter in our environmental history, and we begin a new era for clean air. This landmark legislation will reduce air pollution each year by 56 billion pounds. That's 224 pounds for every man, woman, and child in America. Virtually every person in every city and every town will enjoy its benefits. It is simply the most significant air pollution legislation in our nation's history, and it restores America's place as the global leader in environmental protection. And today I am very proud 
uh, on behalf of everyone here to sign this uh, Clean Air Bill, Clean Air Act of 1990. What has been the effect on human health? What has that meant for people overall? Just sort of in broad brushstrokes, how do we know that it's been successful in a human health context? Well, we have studies that have shown that, uh, like the Harvard Six City study where they showed over many years. So these cohort studies are really useful in that they can see the long-term pollution exposures, how they change, and then how people's health improves. And the city, Steubenville, Ohio, which is not far from Pittsburgh, was one of the study cities. Over the years, they've documented that as the pollution levels have come down, adjusting for other factors, the um, mortality rates have come down in the cities uh, across, especially in the high pollution cities have been a, a lowering of the rate of deaths per year after adjusting for age and smoking and all these other factors. So in Steubenville, Ohio, like uh, how how much longer can somebody on average live now, given you know what they might have done fifty years ago, just as a ballpark? People estimate that air pollution generally costs us a couple of years of life historically over the last you know few studies. So we're maybe halfway there. I don't have an exact number, but you know on the order of a year added to the life lifespan expected lifespan of somebody in those cities. So this is real and significant and directly tied to reduction in air pollution. And yet, one of the things that's been interesting to me coming to this region is that I'll get up in the morning and and one of the first things you hear on the local radio is whether this is actually a high pollution day or not. So we still have a long way to go. This brings me to a seminal study that you were responsible for, along with your colleague, Dr. Ue Yu, that the closure of one of Pittsburgh's biggest coal processing plants, that's the Shenango Coke Works, it's on Neville Island, it's a few miles mm-hmm. down the Ohio River from downtown Pittsburgh, led to immediate and lasting declines in fossil fuel-related air pollutants. These were linked to what was a near-instant decrease in local heart-related emergency department visits and hospitalizations for cardiovascular disease for residents in the surrounding communities. So tell me what you found and tell me how you could be so sure that there was this direct relationship. There were a lot of cross-checks that we did because what we saw was this sort of a slow and steady rise in this community, the community right around the Shenango plant, for cardiovascular and respiratory and children's asthma. But what we saw was that at the time, the January 2016, the plant closed. At that community that lived around the plant, we saw a dramatic drop in children's pediatric uh, admissions and cardiovascular visits to emergency departments in the area. And so we're, you know, really talking about a dramatic decline in a matter of a week or two. While The other comparison communities kept slowly rising. So it was very specific and very clear. And we looked at also within the community, we looked at injury emergency department visits, and those kept the same trend. They didn't drop dramatically. So it wasn't some artifact of the way the data were being collected. And uh, it was a very clear distinction between the communities that were further away and the community that was right around the plant. So you've got a direct connection here between the reduction in pollution and the reduction of those visits. How big a surround of the community? Like how many miles away was the the area that you were looking at? How close? Yeah, it was just a few miles. And it varied a little bit because we were using zip codes. Mm -hmm. So those go in sort of different directions, different distances. So tell me, what is happening? What is the pollution that was coming out of the smokestacks there on Neville Island from the Shenango Coke Works? And if I'm a child that went to the emergency room before, and I'm one of the ones that didn't go afterwards. What was happening to me? I was breathing this in, and what was I breathing in, and what was sending me to the emergency room? Well, it is a mixture of pollutants, and the different pollutants have different kinds of effects. One of the dramatic, like a 90% reduction, was in sulfur dioxide emissions, which can have very acute effects on children uh, with asthma. And we saw a dramatic drop in those. But we also saw a big drop in the pollutants related to coal. We saw arsenic drop dramatically, and that's a pollutant that comes out of coal burning. Uh, If you look in the atmosphere around the world, arsenic in the air is largely from coal burning or coal processing, like this coking plant 
that came down sulfur in the air, which also, again, the coal is very high in sulfur. You know, we're talking about very small particles, less than one micron in diameter, uh, whereas your hair, human hair is about 70, and these are about 0.5, 0.6 commonly. So these are really, really small particles, and they can get into your lungs, and then uh, they can solubilize, and they can also pass through and go into your bloodstream and go systemically. So whereas the SO2 effects are generally on the lung directly, the particles can much more go systemically. And those seem to be most related in other studies and in our study with the cardiovascular effects. The interesting thing is EPA has, and other studies, look at general pollution. So that's a mixture of so windblown soil, particles coming from other sources, uh, wearing tires, uh, all sorts of a variety of things, and they treat them as if they're all the same. But these particles are much more toxic per pound. And so if we use the EPA model for predicting the number of cases of cardiovascular visits that would be reduced by that amount of pollution, it, it way underestimated the reduction we found. i tell you, one of the key things I, I would draw from this is that we are way under predicting the health benefits that are being derived and can be derived from transitioning from fossil fuel burning to other sources, non-combustion sources of energy. So it's remarkable to be able to have that connection. And if I play that back, and I'm a young child that lives a couple miles away from the Shenango Coke Works, that there are at least two things going on. One is that I've got sulfur dioxide that's coming in, and in the near term, having an acute respiratory asthma attack, that piece in here. And so that's a part of what went away. And then you've got these very, very, very small particles that unfortunately can get in the lungs and are beautifully connected to getting into the bloodstream. And your point is that not all particles are created equal in terms of the havoc it can wreak in your body, and that these unfortunately are very good at creating really bad things for folks when they get in. And so I think it's sort of counterintuitive because it's one thing to say, well, the air looks an awful lot cleaner, or if I'm near a fire and the ash is going by and I feel like, you know, it's getting in my face and I'm coughing, that kind of stuff, that somehow if you got rid of the big particles floating around, that would solve the issue. But in some ways here, what you're saying is these smaller particles are actually worse because they are more effective at getting in and having these broader systemic effects on the human body. Is that what's going on? Yeah, pretty much. You got it. These particles are so small uh, and insidious that they can get into our body and, and they've been found throughout the body and, and they cause inflammation and atherosclerosis and oxidative stress is their primary mechanism, uh, which is something we all try and avoid by eating foods that are high in antioxidants. And that's a good idea, you know, what your mother told you, you know, fruits and vegetables, eat them. She was right. And we actually did a, another study where we had a cohort of about a half million people we followed over time. And we did find in that study that the people who followed the Mediterranean diet had a much reduced impact of particle pollution on their mortality risk. One of the outcomes in the bigger picture that has happened recently is that the EPA actually has changed its standard. So what are you seeing right now if we started this conversation with the Clean Air Act being a really important national standard with goals that needed to be hit? Is there something that's just happened that is helpful in this mix or what has to happen next in order to assure that we get to this place that is fair for everybody? There was a, a recent uh, revision of the standard, and industry is already pushing back on that. Various states, more than 10, have already uh, said they're bringing suit against this uh, standard, going from 12 micrograms down to 9. So we're basically saying they're aiming to do about 25% better. And they're saying, oh, well, this is going to be too expensive, and uh, they've always said that. And the thing is that their calculation doesn't consider the expense we already have. Well, this pollution is putting an expense in terms of our health and causing hospital visits and deaths and asthma attacks. And so this is a cost. And, and people have assigned, economists have assigned values to these, the increased risk. 
And when you look at the benefits, the health benefits of cleaning the air, they far outweigh the cost. And there is a cost to cleaning the air and doing things with cleaner technology. But the benefits far outweigh that cost. And they say it's going to lose jobs and it's going to destroy the economy. And history tells us that's just not true. The U.S. economy has grown uh, rapidly while pollution levels have plummeted since 1970. It's been a very successful uh, law and it really hasn't had all of the negative cataclysmic kinds of economic effects that the industry always claims. If you look at it holistically for the society and for the country, it, you were saving money and saving lives at the same time. And the way the law is written, it says we should set a law that is protective of health with a sufficient margin of error, and we should not consider the cost of that. It specifically says we shouldn't do it. But even if you do, it really pays for itself. And yet, you said there's already pushback from multiple states and from multiple players, industry players, against this most recent EPA standard change. Talk a little bit about how that's played out in your life. You're a scientist that has deeply studied this. You've published papers and reports. You um, speak frequently. Have you directly experienced some of this pushback? Yes. I, oh, I've had experiences over, over time. You know, I've had some of the industry-funded people make fun of my work and try and make light of it and say that there are problems with it. But the, that research has always stood up to scrutiny. And we, because we're really careful and we look at all the other possibly confounding factors and we dot all the I's and cross all the T's and uh, we're able to defend that work. And then other people replicate the work in other places and so there's a real lot of consistency from researcher to researcher and from place to place. I had one study we did of children with asthma that we did in Connecticut, and there was a web page. I, I don't want to mention who, who it is, That's fine. but that attacked it and said, well, I can imagine that, you know, they're telling these children that there's a pollution episode going on and they'll all be frightened and have asthma attacks. And that was totally false. What we did was we collected the pollution separately that no one knew what the pollution levels were. Then there was a separate collection by nurses and physicians at an asthma camp. It was a camp designed to help children actually go out and do activities and deal with their asthma. And, and what we found, of course, is that on the high pollution days, the kids were going in much larger numbers to the health uh, center there. And uh, so we recorded the number of asthma exacerbations with pollution, and there was a definite relationship. But they didn't know, the doctors didn't know, it was a double-blind kind of study where we knew what the pollution was, but the health people didn't know that, and, and we didn't have the records of the uh, hospital until afterwards we put it all together. So they come up with these things, and it never stands up to the criticisms. That is well put and leads to um, a nice segue. Uh, we sometimes have a special guest questioner here. Today, that question is from someone who greatly admires your work. Hi, George. It's Phil Johnson, Senior Program Director of Environment and Health at the Heinz Endowments. I have long had the utmost respect for your innovative and path-breaking research and how you have helped to make the world a healthier and safer place, especially for our most susceptible populations. You are a fearless champion of public health and have been a leading voice for decades. When many scientists stay in the background, you are not afraid to face opposition head on. Where do you find that courage? I think, for one thing, I've been blessed to have the education that I have received uh, at some of the finest institutions in the world. And so, having been allowed to have that, uh, it's uh, I have a responsibility. It's my duty to do that. Plus, I work at a prestigious university and medical center, and that gives me a platform to speak from. To have that platform and not use it would be a crime. The problem I have uh, really is people take uh, the facts, the science, and they twist them, and they misrepresent them. And so it's responsible of us who do the science to step up and say, no, this is the proper interpretation. And we just can't take our science and publish it and put it out there and say, well, I'll let politicians and the policy people interpret it and implement it, because they really don't understand it completely. And if they have a, 
a motive they misrepresented. And you really have to not only do your science, you have to defend it and make sure it's properly interpreted and translated. And that's really a big motivator. Where did you get that from? I mentioned in the intro, you went to Brown University, and and that's a place where you can craft your own path. But you just eloquently said you, you feel a responsibility both to the research, I believe, to the science, but also to society to utilize the gifts you've received academically and then the position you're in. Where did that come from? What, what was that motivating piece that you started on that journey? I think it probably comes a bit from my parents who both served in World War II. Hmm. And my mom was a, one of the very first female military pilots. Wow. She didn't do combat, but no, they towed targets, and uh, which is dangerous work. And they also transported ferried planes from one theater to another and things like that. And my father served in the Pacific. So, you know, that kind of uh, national service, I, I think I was raised with that. Now, today's field hearing in New York City on air quality at the World Trade Center site. A Senate Environment and Public Works subcommittee held the hearing. Five months ago today, just blocks from this site, tragedy struck this nation and this city like never before. But today we've gathered to discuss a particular problem, the public health consequences of the attacks on the World Trade Center. Uh, Dr. Thurston. My research center at the uh, NYU School of Medicine received an urgent request from the office of the director of the NIEHS, the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, one of the National Institutes of Health, to respond to the environmental impacts of the attack of September 11th by doing whatever we could to monitor the air pollution that was resulting from the disasters, dust, and fires. So can I transition for a second to sort of a different thing? There was another instance um, in a fairly high-profile way where you not only spoke up to industry and government officials, but in some ways bypassed them entirely. And that was the affected communities in the days and weeks after the World Trade Center disaster, 9-11. What spurred you at that moment to do that work and in that space? And how do you think about that today? Oh, yeah. Well, I, I do think that was one of those moments I felt that I was born to do. I had the training and the knowledge about the particles, which was the big problem with 9-11 pollution. And I felt that it was important to try and bring the scientists. And there was a gap. There really was a big gap between the public and the government. And what the government was saying and what the people were experiencing were two very different things. The government, um, I don't know if you ever saw the movie Casablanca, Mm-hmm. Sure. Probably so. Yeah. And in that movie, they say, well, round up the usual suspects. Right. They know what that means, you know, that we're not going to really search too hard. We'll just round up. And uh, EPA uh, rounded up the usual suspects and they measured the pollution that the law sort of requires. And they looked at fine particulate matter, which normally is the big concern, right? They did what was the regulatory things. But this was a completely different situation. So we did a much broader monitoring, you know, more using more research tools of looking at different sizes of particles and and different attributes of the particles that people were breathing. And the problem was the EPA was saying, well, you know, we're meeting the fine particle mass standard, which they were after the first week or so. But the problem was the coarse particles, which normally are not a big problem, would land in the upper airways of the lungs And we analyzed those, and we found that they were very alkaline, about the same pH as Drano, okay? So you can imagine this is not something you really want to to breathe. You know, we're meeting the fine particle standard, but these large particles, which are not part of the standard, the routine measurements, they were causing people to breathe in this caustic and have the World Trade Center cough. So people were saying, I've got this cough, they're saying the air is safe to breathe, and that's when conspiracy theories started, you know, when people were saying they're lying to us. And in fact, they just didn't understand, they didn't look broadly. And and the important thing for me was to try and bridge this gap between the public and the government. Conspiracy theories that seem to abound to be amplified by social media these days are often taking the science and warping it. But what you also pointed out, that the conspiracy theories happen when there are gaps in somebody's just lived experience, what's happening in their life, and what somebody else 
who's not nearby or who's an official or someplace else says is going on. And what you just eloquently said is that science can actually be a pathway to bridging that gap, to actually de-escalating a situation where conspiracy theories could thrive. Is that the right way to think about that? Is that how you look at science in this day and age where you see so much misinformation out in the ecosystem? I do think science is a way to try and bridge a lot of this. And there was a recent poll that was reported in Nature. They found that the public's trust in scientists and physicians is very high relative to other sources of information, politicians and clergy and a lot of uh, institutions. There's a responsibility. If people trust the scientists, then the scientists need to speak. And they need to get out and say, this is what the science is, and this is the truth in the matter, you know, as we understand it. Science is an ever-evolving knowledge base. The, what we advise, what we think, does evolve based on new data. It's important to have that caveat. The Supreme Court struck down an Environmental Protection Agency rule, cracking down on power plant pollution, and yet another blow to the Biden administration as it looks to deliver on its decarbonization goals. Justices voted 5-4 to block the EPA's so-called good neighbor plan, which sought to strictly limit ozone pollution from power plants and other industrial sources in 11 U.S. states, including air pollutants that the agency said can drift downward into other states and cause additional harm. Justice is Sonia Sotomayor, Elena Kagan, Amy Coney Barrett, and Katanji Brown Jackson dissented. There has been this recent Supreme Court focus now on on essentially the good neighbor policy. Right. What is that case and what are the implications? It comes down to the air pollution respects no borders. I mean, we have monitored pollution in New York City that we we're able to backtrack to China using trace element fingerprints to the Gobi Desert. Where there was a big desert storm and came across and hit the West Coast and the East Coast. So this pollution travels. And again, each state is responsible for meeting the air quality standards. And if the pollution that's coming across the border from an upwind state is already exceeding the standard, how do you manage to meet the standards? Because you're already screwed by this pollution that's coming in from upwind. And that's the whole idea of having a national standard rather than leaving it to each of the states to set their own goals. But yeah, so the good neighbor is basically saying, you know, don't take your trash and throw it over the fence into my yard. You've got to at least clean up the air enough so that the downwind states have a chance of meeting the standard. It's similar to, you know, trying to put something in the Mississippi and then it's affecting people downstream. You know, there was a period where right after the Clean Air Act came in, all these power plants put up taller stacks. And they said, see, we've satisfied the standards locally. You know, the EPA has been pretty careful about not letting them do that. They're trying to undermine that basic principle. Super helpful. I mean, it's what we talked about before is the push and pull of policy environment. You can, you know, work administratively at the federal level. You can have the APA ratcheting down a standard for allowable particulates, and you can have a court system that might actually be moving in the other direction. Um, And I think it's probably just another lesson for the future here at the interplay between science and policy, different branches of government and where things are ascending. So as you look forward, as you see this moment and you look forward and you look at your research, there is an awful lot that is changing in our world. One of the biggest ones that we're seeing more and more are the impacts of climate change. Uh, What a decade ago may have been saying, well, these are things that are going to be dangerous weather patterns that could emerge down the road. Those are here now, and there are only going to be more of those. Some of them directly related to your work. We've got in February, some of the largest wildfires happening in the history of Texas. The West has had years with unprecedented acreage burning uh, here in Pittsburgh and in the Midwest with the Canadian wildfires last year, unprecedented pollution that looked an awful lot like the Pittsburgh of the 1950s. So what do you see coming that in your area of expertise, the intersection of air pollution and human health, are trends that you're paying attention to that you think need more research and understanding? Is that one or are there others coming up this decade and beyond? 
I really see that we need more focus on something that I've been working on my entire career, which is the effects of particles in the air and how they vary depending on the source. Particles are all different. We published the first paper that said that the fine particulate matter was associated with increased risk of mortality, PM2.5. We called it FPM, fine particulate matter then. It was before it was called PM2.5. But when we did that, we said, but this effect varies with source, particle source, and particle composition. I used trace element fingerprints and separated out the mass into what came from coal, what came from traffic, what came from steel plants, metallurgic works, and so on. And the biggest effects per microgram were fossil fuel-related particles, like we're talking about at this plant. And that's a message that was in that study and in virtually every study that I've done over the years and other people have done uh, where they have done it. And what I'm finding is that the fossil fuel particles are way more toxic than most other particles that are out there and that we're greatly underestimating the health benefits of transitioning from fossil fuel combustion-based energy to non-fossil fuel energy sources. And we will see massive uh, improvements in health globally if we can make that transition. And, and I, so I see a, a much healthier humanity if we can transition off of fossil fuels. That is a, a real positive that I think will come out of this if we make a transition off of fossil fuels for our energy production, that we will have a healthier humanity. And then and, and also could help save the planet at the same time. That seems like a double bottom line that we could all be in favor of. So the name of this podcast is We Can Be, and we hope it invites people to envision a positive change like you just laid out. So at the end, we ask all of our guests, what do you hope or believe our world can be? We can be healthier. We can be healthier.